Our next speaker is Kelly Citron. Kelly is from Generation Opportunity and is the former director of People Against the NDAA New York. Kelly is a grassroots activist and volunteer, has been active in politics since high school, former People Against the NDAA team, state team leader and head of several anti-drone campaigns. Kelly has extensive experience speaking in front of legislators, political groups, and at more than a dozen rallies, active in Amnesty International and the Home Drone Campaign. Kelly has organized small-scale demonstrations and staged public debates between Rochester professors and public figures. Kelly worked for a year in China tutoring improvised girls in impoverished, sorry, girls in English and learning Chinese. She is currently working on a campaign against Coca-Cola for human rights abuses. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Kelly Citron. Uh, it's it's fantastic to be able to speak to you guys, and um, there's nothing better than being able to speak to other activists, so I'm incredibly excited. And I want to thank uh, Dan and the Solutions Institute for, for inviting me to speak. Um, the theme of, my converse, of our conversation today um, is going to be about how to convey power. And I think this is particularly relevant for young activists, uh, for women, and for minority activists. Uh, who have a slew of stereotypes against them, and I, I do apologize for any older male activists in the audience, but it's, it's also incredibly important, regardless of your uh, socioeconomic status, to convey power. Um, one of the most important things about power is that, uh, although it may not be imaginary, it is imagined. Uh, power only really exists where people believe that it exists. And one thing that's incredibly exciting about the ability of grassroots activists to tap into the symbols and the codes of power is that we can use that to subvert actual coercive structures of power, that we can use um, powerful dynamics, the, uh, presenting ourselves as influential, as a way to fight institutions um, that would use their power for malice uh, it, it, is, it is incredibly exciting, and it's something that um, I've really come to be passionate about in activism. Um, I have two rules, uh, two general modes of demeanor for, for the way to conduct yourself in, in a powerful way. And there's, there's many ways to do it, but I have two ones that I find particularly important. And that's to be brief, uh, to always say as little as possible, and to use stereotypes about you. Uh, against the people who you're opposing, um, to use them, uh, you know, to, to be a cliche, but to use them to your advantage, to turn strengths, um, oh, sorry, to turn weaknesses into strengths. Um, it's incredibly important, again, for, for people who, uh, as grassroots activists, do not have much money to use in lobbying. Now, um, I do want to start with a quick anecdote about how power uh, and powerful dynamics have been used against me. Um, and how I've been influenced by them. And it's actually about uh, Daniel Johnson, who is the founder of People Against the NDAA, well, with whom I've worked, and uh, of course, Solutions Institute, and uh, an, an incredibly close friend of mine. But how our working relationship began uh, is he created a power dynamic with me. I had invited him out to New York to speak, and uh, he then asked if I would be a member of People Against the NDAA, uh, I, was, I was very excited, uh, but there was one phrase that he used to create a power dynamic between the two of us that was incredibly effective. Um, towards the end of the conversation, he, he looked at me and he became thoughtful, and then he said, uh, you know, I've, I don't think I've ever had a competent female state team leader, one who, who has really been a go-getter. And of course, knowing my personality, as, as he met with me a few times, uh, I was immediately incensed, and I would spend the next six months, hundreds of dollars, and drive hundreds of miles uh, all around my state in order to campaign for Dan's organization. Now, I believed in the cause. I absolutely did. But I was made to work harder for Dan and Dan's organization than I had ever been able to work for myself. Um, that was an incredible lesson in, in that kind of influence and that kind of authority. Now, uh, to get to my two rules, the first one is to be brief. 
And I realize it's ironic I will be speaking at length about brevity. Um, but it's a good rule of thumb that any person who is speaking more in any given conversation is less powerful. You can see this in personal relationships. Um, if you're at a party, the person who's talking your ear off is generally speaking not the most popular person at the party. Um, or, or even um, the way that a lot of times we establish our, our power as consumers is we ask to speak to a manager. Um, we understand our power and then yet submit to others' influence and others' power when it's a demanding girlfriend or, or a mother. The person who is meant to justify themselves um, who has to speak more, they will place themselves lower um, in the minds of many people. So a great way to elevate yourself uh, in, in terms of power and in terms of perceived influence is to say very little. And when you do say something, to say it definitively. Um, speeches, there's a great example. Um, you always want to err on the shorter side for speeches. Um, they, they should be concise, they should be clear, you should use very plain language, uh, and they should all revolve around one central idea. But most importantly is that they should be brief. Um, because people, generally speaking, um, people will, not, not, it's, it's not exactly because of a short attention span, but it's because they will only revere you as an expert on one idea um, for the moment. They want to hear one idea from you and they want to hear it expressed concisely. Probably the best example of this is with the uh, Abraham Lincoln during the Civil War, and the one of the greatest speeches in American history was the Gettysburg Address, address considered to be one of the greatest speeches in American history. Um, the man who spoke before him spoke for nearly two hours uh, on the subject of uh, the fight against the South, and once he had gotten down and everyone was sufficiently bored, Abraham Lincoln uh, stepped up, even being a very poor public speaker, having a very tinny voice, um, often speaking too fast. Uh, he gave a minute and a half speech that would go down in history as, again, one of the most revered and powerful speeches in American history. Um, but it's not only speeches that you can do this. Again, as I mentioned, in, in conversation, particularly um, in recruitment, it can be extremely powerful. If you let the other person speak more, it not only engenders you to them, it not only allows them to feel as if their ideas are being considered, but it also distances you from them. It, it puts up a bit of a barrier, um, a barrier of respect that, that should be there uh, sometimes in, in organizations, that you shouldn't feel like you can be accessed all the time and that your opinion on every subject uh, should be, be able to be accessed all the time. This kind of allowing them to say their piece while you know being affirmative and being polite uh, can be extremely powerful. And then in situations where you are speaking to someone who has a greater influence or a greater perceived influence than you do, um, it's not so much allowing them to speak more but forcing them to speak more. Um, asking pointed questions asking for, for in-depth explanations of, of positions and policy and opinions. Although it may seem that they are the one providing more information and therefore have more influence, have more knowledge, um, in that situation, you are goading them. You're getting more information out of them. You are allowing them to possibly paint themselves into a corner in an argument. Again, you want to step back be brief and say very little. Um, it's also good for those of us who don't have uh, an incredibly extensive public speaking experience that you trip over yourself less when you say less. Um, and again, it, it can calm the nerves very much when you understand that silence is actually incredibly powerful. Um, so again, I, I recognize the irony that uh, I've spoken at length um, about brevity. Um, but again, I, I, think, I think that's probably one of my most, most important points, is that you can create dynamics uh, where they don't exist or where they haven't previously existed.
But the second point that um, I have found in my own experience that has been incredibly powerful is the reversal of stereotypes. Um, I don't really know what the demographic is uh, for the listeners and for the audience of uh, ActCon, um, but for myself, being a woman, as a, as a lobbyist, um, and as a general activist, there absolutely are a set of uh, preconceived notions that you enter any room in about yourself. But again, it's, it's, it's far beyond gender. Um, I've found actually that the most powerful ones happen to be ones that are about youth. Um, perceptions of youth in activism are, are, pre are prevalent. And while most of my speaking I've done in front of, um, for example, groups like the, the Tea Party, um, slightly more conservative groups or, or perhaps groups that were just an older demographic for me, um, there is a list of conceived, preconceived notions uh, about about that. And it's very important that you turn that on its head. Um, walk, er walk in early. Um, be ex like incredibly impeccably dressed. Um, that's, that's one of the best ways that you can show respect, especially again to an older demographic group. Um, speak very clearly. Uh, enunciate. Again, the big one, don't use slang. Um, don't use references that may be outside of their purview and defer to them, which can be incredibly important. Because again, another stereotype about young activists is that they are disrespectful, um, that they're firebrands, that they don't have reverence for an older class, um, an older class of people. Without, without these preconceived notions, there actually wouldn't be any for us to manipulate. So in many ways, I've found myself to be incredibly grateful that these ideas exist because they allow me to seemingly set myself apart in activism, even though I don't actually think that most of those stereotypes are true. To my audience, I am setting myself apart. Um, I am singular, again, to my audience, and because of that, they trust me more. But that's not always the case. You should not always uh, dress in opposition to your stereotypes. Um, just because you're young, you shouldn't always dress older. For example, if you're speaking in front of younger groups, Amnesty International, um, Greenpeace, uh, organizations that tend to be populated by younger people, and in my case, uh, I thought women um, tend to be numerous in these kind of organizations, to this kind of extraordinary professionalism, um, seeming to go above and beyond seems insincere. It seems um, disingenuous. The best thing that I think I've found in, in my career is to understand what your audience will think of you and then to play into that. So if my audience knows me as a, as a colleague, um, as someone of a similar age group, you lean into that. You, you start talking about a coalition of people of a similar age making, making a difference. And even if you don't actually agree with that ideology, even if you're trying to subvert that organization, I think that could even be more powerful because you're, you're welcomed, um, you're seen as a member and not an outsider. And then from inside, you can start to bring in, rein in the ideology or, or manipulate it. And again, I realize manipulate has a, has a negative connotation, but I just mean manipulate the symbols of it. To ever be actually disingenuous um, is, can absolutely kill an activist's career. But to know what symbols to use among, again, conservative groups when you're younger, to wear bolder colors, um, darker colors, black, red, white, blue, just very solid colors. Um, but again, when you're with a younger group, to do things that are more pale, um, that seem softer, you need to be able to play your physicality into where you are. Um, it, it immediately makes people more comfortable before you even say anything. Uh, and it, it is, it's incredibly powerful. Um, so that's kind of, that is the... Cor that is the correlation that I'm talking about. It's a duality. You, you do not always want to lean into your, your strengths because you can overblow them. And you don't always want to fight against your stereotypes 
because sometimes they're disingenuous. Um, sometimes they don't really reflect well on the situation. Um, and just as a final note on that, um, I think if you can take a single piece away from this, uh, this talk, uh, a single thing to know that you can do, it's that you can manipulate these symbols. That is in your toolbox. Um, it's all, in my opinion, uh, as influence, it's shadow and smoke and mirrors. To, to make this a point, I didn't think I was gonna say this, but I am sitting on my parents' couch with a borrowed iPad, a borrowed jacket, and an inside out tank top and jeans. And still, hopefully, was able to convey a message um, because of positioning, because of uh, how I express myself, and because of how I am physically. So I hope that you guys enjoyed that. And uh, if anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Thank you so much, Kelly. Uh, yes, I, we certainly have some questions for you. I appreciate your time and, and your great presentation. Is there a way to use negative stereotypes to your advantage? Absolutely. I would, I would actually, um, I have a short little anecdote for this. Um, I remember I was, I went into the New York State Senate and um, I'm sure, uh, again, Dan Johnson, he's heard this story many times, but there was a, an older gentleman who was a New York State Senator who kind of leaned, leaned down to me as I was explaining my bill and said, um, what, what high school, high school do you come from? And I go, actually, I'm with people against the NDAA. I'm a lobbyist. Um, I'm here to explain some legislation that I'm proposing. Um, and he just goes, oh, well, now isn't that so cute? Um, that's immediate dismissal. And what's great about immediate dismissal is that that person no longer perceives you as a threat. And I had over the next three to four weeks, um, hundreds of my, of my constituents, constituents, followers, um, members of my organization write letters to him, um, mentioning my name, making sure to mention my name, uh, mentioning my organization and pressing forward for the legislation. Uh, what's great is that he hadn't researched me, had not researched my organization. Even though I had presented him most of my ideas when I was there, he had no interest in me because he didn't perceive me as a threat. And within two weeks, I had a meeting with him in his office and he was pointing me in the direction of people who could help me and I had his support. Um, so yeah, absolutely. I, I think that there are absolutely ways that you can, you can bend those stereotypes usually through surprise, I would say, is probably your best bet. <laughs> Great. What, what advice would you give to young people on how to be taken seriously in a political environment such as a luncheon with the state legislature? I would say, first of all, do not go into a situation like that unless you have um, some kind of coalition. Coalition building first is extremely important because you can only prop yourself up so much. They start asking you particulars about what you want done, um, how many followers you have. You can't really make yourself powerful in that kind of setting unless you just lie, which is not advisable. Um, so I would say, first off, coalition building is probably the most important. Um, to have some kind of momentum behind you before you start stepping into legislatures. Um, and, and plus, it's a great way to kind of exercise your talents. You can speak in front of groups of 10, 15, 20, start speaking to even, as I spoke to sheriffs a lot before I even started going to legislatures. Um, coalition build before, and that will give you the confidence and the knowing confidence that you do have support uh, in, in situations like that. Great. How should someone best prepare for a meeting with their representative? Um, I would say research their positions on similar uh, pieces of legislation. Um, I know when I was when I was doing research for people against the NDAA, um, one of the big things that we looked for was what their um, what their position on the Safe Act was. And if you're not from New York, the Safe Act um, it's a piece of legislation that limits gun ownership, and it's a very nasty piece of legislation and very poorly written, but 
whether or not they supported um, the confiscation of firearms and things like that could lend you to believe whether or not they'll support your bill, just ideologically, uh, politically, where, where their constituents are. So figure out if it's going to be an oppositional meeting um, or if it's going to be a kind of already a uh, coalition sort of meeting. If you have to convince them to act or if you have to convince them to first think the way you do, because those will be two very, very different conversations. You know, from the New York uh, standpoint, coalition building, you mentioned when, when approaching the legislature, you mentioned how important that is. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Because I, I, I was involved in the, in the New York event uh, with the passage of the resolution in Albany. And I remember that coalition and I like people to understand better how how well that worked in that instance, if you could. Yeah, absolutely. Um, one of my, one of, I guess, the guiding philosophies of Panda, generally speaking, um, hasn't been bipartisan or, or, or multipartisan, it's been antipartisan. Um, one of, to me, the best ways to build on a coalition, to take people from different ideologies, is to make it around uh, a single problem. You're not trying to sell people on, say, libertarianism in general. If you're talking about uh, opposing indefinite detention, you don't also have to convince them immediately that taxes are theft. That's, you need to remember to focus on one piece. And that way, you can take people from the Green Party. You can take people who consider themselves independents, um, Republicans who are... Con who are tired of government control, Democrats who are tired of over-militarization. There is something, if you really do believe that your cause is just, there will be something in it that will appeal to all the groups. But you have to remember to stay on message. I've monitored a lot of calls um, in which I've had people from the Green Party along with people from the Tea Party. I've, even, I've had self-avowed socialists on, on these kind of big conference calls. And it's always important to if people start straying you have to keep them on message and on in the pocket in the for the goal um, otherwise it'll spiral out of control but those kind of coalitions are extremely powerful because they break down what we consider political barriers well thank you so much for being on the show kelly that's great presentation and i really appreciate your input at con too appreciate your appearance and of course we look forward to working with you in the future and uh, if you'd like to anybody who would like to reach out to Kelly how would they do that Kelly? Uh, you can email me at kellycitron at gmail.com just my name or um, I have a phone line it's always open at 315-723-5549 I will take calls from any activist who wants to talk. Fantastic. Thank you so much for being here and we wish you well and we'll be working with you in the future. All right. Thank you very much.